what do we have on right now? I see nine participants, but realize Mike and I count as two of those. Okay, so seven. Yeah, I, have, I don't see I'm, anything at the moment yet as a message from you. How many people were signed up originally? Uh, originally, I believe it was 14. Says I'm using computer early. I'm sending another chat message. This one uh, you should be able to see. Yes, I see that. So what do we, what shall I, we do with that? Uh, you can you can type a message at the bottom of that column, and oh, we'll we all can. be able to see that. Okay, but we can just ask the question, right? You can you can pipe right in. I'm not going to okay. uh, mute the the crowd since it's not a large group, okay. and I have experience with high school students, so I'm not worried about you getting out of control. I can send you out of the room. <laughs> We're, we're, we're so scooped up, we might. Yeah. <laughs> well, if anybody just wants to vent, that's fine with me too. Uh, that's, that's the spirit of Impressionism. Just play it by the moment. So I have something here. Uh, we're, we're two minutes before the, uh, the official start. I wanted to say that... Uh, You should be seeing a picture of Toulouse -Lautre by Toulouse Lautrec here. Yes. Uh, yes. I can't. I can't see what's on your screen. That's a little bit of a, a oh. handicap I have here. Uh, but I can see all your faces on the side here. Anyway, I put this up here uh, as a uh, parallel to the lighting problem I have. Uh, Toulouse uh, and I, I think, have trouble working with artificial light. And that's why this guy's uh, this guy's face looks peculiarly lit. And here's for comparison's sake, is my own. There you go. It's just about just about the same problem there. Uh, I haven't worked out how to see your screen. Uh, I had another. I had a laptop I was going to join with, but I forgot to I forgot to set that up. So we'll just wing it. And I'm going to assume uh, when I show you a picture, you'll see a picture. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's just about get rolling here. Um, uh, I've taught this class before on, uh, Impressionism. Uh, I'm wearing my, uh, uh, Henri Rousseau tie that a student, uh, gave me, uh, once when I taught this class. Very proud of that. It's like a, it's like a testimonial, you know, to, uh, to my, uh, erudition. And uh, so I'm wearing that proudly. Uh, um, here's where we're coming from on this class. Uh, we're going to review the work of uh, major, uh, major painters in the Impressionism and post-Impressionism movements. And we're going to approach this from uh, my perspective, uh, which is uh, as a postmodern artist. So what for one thing, what do all these posts mean? Post-impressionism and post-modernism, and and how do those names uh, arise? Um, to to not give something uh, a separate name of its own is is a peculiar thing too. I mean, why is it why is it that uh, Van Gogh and Gauguin are post-impressionists? and uh, Pizarro and Monet are Impressionists. What's the difference? And do they have anything in common? Similarly, from my perspective, it's just so curious. It's just a curious bit of nomenclature that there's such a thing as postmodernism. It seems to me there should be modernism. That's what's happening now. And how does the post get in? Well, uh, how names catch on is a peculiarity too. That's a that's a cultural artifact. Uh, for instance, uh, the name Impressionism comes from a painting by uh, Monet that was shown in the uh, the first Impressionist show, 
there were seven or eight of these. They were the uh, the independents. Uh, they called themselves uh, the anonymous independents, in fact. And uh, the the uh, point of view uh, was that they were outside of the salon. They were outside of the main uh, um, established art group, uh, the Academy de Beaux Arts and the Salon de Paris organized its own shows. And uh, uh, from the late 1860s, Monet and other like-minded artists had rejection. They couldn't show their work in the established academies. So they developed their own show. It was called the Society Anam Anonyme de Artistes, Painters, Sculptors, and Graviers, uh, the Anonymous Society of Painters, Sculptors, and Engravers. And they exhibited their works independently. Their first exhibit was held in 1874. Uh, Monet exhibited the work that gave the, the group its name, uh, which is um, called uh, Impressionism. Here it is, Impressionism Sunrise. Let me put that up on the screen here. There you go. Um, can people see that picture? Just give a shout out. Yes. Yep. Yes, very nice, very nice. That is the picture that uh, gave Impressionism its name. Now, um, what Impressionism comes to mean is a, a snapshot of the moment. And we'll talk a lot about the aesthetic of Impressionism. Uh, it, it began as a, a uh, centrally and primarily uh, a rendition of the landscapes, a, re a rendition of the outside in a plein air style, meaning natural lighting. And what we're going to see in the uh, uh, impressionist uh, paintings that we look at today and, and uh, throughout this four-week course is the, the light always changes and uh, uh, artists like Monet became famous for painting the same uh, subject matter over and over again, but each of the paintings looked different. And the rationale for that is that the light had changed and what they were trying to capture wasn't just the object, but the, the lighting around the object, the aura of the lighting. And, and not only that, they worked in a rapid pace. They painted very quickly. Uh, Van Gogh famously painted just about one painting every day. And that was um, more, more common than extraordinary among Impressionist paintings. They're painting their impression in a moment. So that's the literal meaning of that. It's also been suggested, going back to, uh, going back to the, the first so-called impressionist painting by Monet, it's also been suggested that he was protecting himself from the criticism that the objects were indistinct, that his style was hazy, that he didn't, he, he didn't care to uh, create solid objects in the, uh, the long-standing technique of classical uh, uh, and uh, all the way up to the Romantic period, which preceded the uh, Impressionist period. Uh, it wasn't his concern to use those sorts of uh, painterly skills to create a solid, a solid object. Now think about this for a minute. You construct an object with uh, light and shade, and you construct a picture dating from the Renaissance uh, with tricks of perspective, lines of perspective. Now I say tricks for this reason. Uh, paintings are two-dimensional, and reality, as most of us realize, is three-dimensional. So everything you see in a painting is trickery. Uh, uh, that can't be avoided. The, uh, the, the classical style or the Beaux-Arts style 
the formal salon style that preceded Impressionism and that excluded Impressionists, they had, they had codified these techniques and, and to be in their group or to be an accepted artist, the only artists who could show in Paris as Impressionism got rolling, you needed to paint in that official technique. You needed, you needed to be up to the mark as far as, far as painting uh, technique goes, and you were excluded if you didn't paint in those techniques. So uh, it's, a, it's um, uh, an axiom of postmodernism, uh, which some artists, myself included, are working in today, that these these techniques, these ways of looking at things, are all constructs. In other words, uh, more uh, figments of their time than uh, universal rules that should exist forever and ever for all painters and artists. From the postmodern ex ex uh, point of view, you can pull your ideas from anywhere. You can borrow techniques from any movement and you can cross across all movements and, and everything, everything has equal validity. There's no, there's no right or wrong. And we owe a lot of that attitude to uh, the Impressionists because they rejected a, 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 the prevailing formal style. Now, some Impressionists would have said that Impressionism should become a formal style. Uh, they celebrated the moment and they celebrated light. What they were doing was choosing a, a subject matter as uh, being the proper subject matter for artists. Uh, from the postmodern perspective, they, they go too far. There can't be a right manner of approaching art. Um, but nevertheless, that freedom of thought is very much a part of the way uh, many artists work today. Now, um, uh, that's a reference to the postmodern technique or the postmodern way of looking at things. The style that existed just prior to Impressionism was uh, the Romantic style. And uh, that, since then, has become sort of uh, vilified uh, by painters, including the, uh, especially the abstract painters of the, uh, of the 40s and 50s in this century. Uh, you've heard the expression art for art's sake. That was the motto of the abstract painters who uh, rejected the idea that any object needed to be the subject of a painter's painting. A painting didn't need to be about anything except the technique itself. So, I mean, when we look at the Impressionist painters, we're seeing a difference in technique from the uh, official style that preceded them, including the Romantic artists. Um, uh, I'm gonna pull up, uh, I'm gonna pull up a picture that I've uh, done recently. Uh, they re they rejected this idea of an of an, an official style altogether. The abstract the abstract painters were concerned specifically that um, all they wanted, all they were interested in, was technique for technique's set, sake. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna mention an artist here, Delacroix, Eugene Delacroix, who was a Romantic painter. And his point of view was, was to create allegorical paintings, which, uh, you know, not only were about techniques, but were about ideas, about uh, positing a, 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 his, a history of France to represent France historically, uh, where he would have allegor allegorical figures representing France or ref representing the, the suffering of the workers. This is a lot of ideological bar uh, baggage thrown into the picture that goes well beyond the, uh, well beyond technique, well beyond uh, the, the 
the actual skills of the painter and into uh, supporting, uh, you know, political ideologies or romantic ideologies uh, uh, as they existed at the time. And uh, then you have a movement beginning with the Impressionists to get away from that sort of representation, that sort of, uh, you know, allegory is when you take a figure and, and use it consciously and uh, on purpose as a symbol of something. And, and you can see how that is uh, contrary to the idea of art for art's sake, right? The art for art's sake idea frees the artist just to have uh, his technique, his painterly skills as the subject matter. And as I mentioned, this is taken to the extreme with the, uh, the abstractionists like de Kooning and Jackson Pollock uh, uh, almost a century ago now who wanted to make uh, the artist's technique the only subject of their pain, of painting. They, they rejected objects entirely. So what I'm talking about is a progression that goes from an official style that demanded that an artist use a certain technique to represent his subject, demanded a physical subject in the landscape, and then also in some cases, uh, demanded or and favored this kind of uh, ideological painting that you know uh, re represented uh, the, the Greek gods in uh, um, a tableau of, uh, of creatures who all represented different virtues or vices. Uh, so in the history of art, we see uh, one procession of movements after another that are rejecting that idea of demanding something that an artist do in order to be uh, in order to be commercial, in order to be accepted, and in France, right before the Impressionists, in order to be shown, in order to be exhibited at all. So that's why your Impressionist painters uh, uh, organized their own separate shows and uh, created quite a scandal that we'll that we'll talk about. I wanted to show you this because I'm a, I'm, I'm a vain uh, artist. Uh, this work that I've done recently, just to mention my own work and uh, background, so you'll know who you're dealing with. Uh, we have a picture up here. This is called, it's a collage. It's called uh, Eugenie Delacroix Gives Birth to the Romantic Movement in Painting. And this is a parody of mine. Uh, a parody of art movements themselves. Uh, Eugene Delacroix did uh, contribute to the movement that preceded the artists we'll be talking about, Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. He, he, did, he did dominate that period. And as I mentioned, he'd been vilified for a very long time because of his allegorical style. Uh, you know, here I have the, uh, the cherub, who uh, uh, is coming out representing romanticism. And here's Delacroix, and we have an angel that I've cribbed from the work of um, one of uh, my uh, favorite guys, that William Blake, the great engraver and poet. Uh, I've stolen that image from him. The idea of these uh, semi-allegorical figures is a bit comical to me. And uh, there's a lot of satirical elements in my work. Uh, that has to do with my postmodern bent too, where whenever you're talking about a particular movement, uh, there's a certain amount of irony to that, that the idea, the very idea of artistic movements is uh, uh, somewhat of a convention that can be uh, taken or left alone, depending on the taste of the artist, depending on the the uh, the purposes or the interests of the artist. Now about this, about my style, I work in collage. Uh, all of the work you see here was done with uh, uh, paper that I've amassed in a file over the years. Some of this is mag uh, magazine paper, like the central figures here. Some of it, some of it is newsprint from newspapers. Uh, some of it is newspaper that I've uh, uh, thrown paint against in the in the uh, style the splash style of uh, Jackson Pollock 
if you will. Um, uh, I think about the use of newspaper and current magazines and using them the way a painter uses a palette as uh, being a, a method that supports the idea that, in, that interests me. That idea being that that idea being that art is of the current moment. Art comes from the time that an artist live in, lives in, and that there's no style that should predominate. There's no, there, there shouldn't be an official style. Uh, uh, alternately, one might ask, well, you know, art is a commercial endeavor, and uh, shouldn't, shouldn't art follow from a point of view of what will sell. Uh, that's that's uh, certainly a, a matter of concern, and it was a matter of concern for the Impressionists we'll, we'll talk about, uh, beginning with uh, Pizarro today and going on to Monet. Uh, uh, Pizarro rarely sold any paintings, though he, he amassed thousands and thousands of works. And famously, Van Gogh, uh, perhaps the most uh, well-known artistic model on the planet, uh, this beloved uh, figure. Uh, he famously sold one painting in his lifetime, and, and now uh, any one of his works is worth millions and millions. Uh, what's to be learned there? That, that uh, tastes change over time? which uh, from my point of view as an artist is uh, the fact of life that needs to be accepted bef before you uh, can be forced into a formal category uh, and, and forced to work in some sort of official style. Uh, and then beginning with the Impressionists, they rejected that idea and they grabbed for themselves this piece of uh, independence that I think is is much more crucial than a uh, a, a formal style. Uh, I I didn't know if someone was trying to talk to me. Um, let's look at um, a work. Uh, find something else. Wait a moment. Here we go. I'm going to put up a piece by uh, by uh, sorry by Pizarro. This is from 1867, just about the time of the first impressionist. Uh, show, you'll notice that the objects here are much more distinct than they were in the work of his contemporary Monet. I don't want to see part of it. Oh, oh we're only seeing part of the... Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I was wondering if it was everybody or just me. No, it's... I see. I, I seem to have a... I don't know. Something happened. There we go. Now it's okay. Okay. It, I just blocked it off. I'm going to put it back up and see if I can get just the one picture I'm interested in. Thanks for your feedback. As as you uh, may realize, this is this is new to me. How does that look? Do you see a complete image? Yes, yes. but it's a different painting. Yeah, uh, this is the one that I want to show. That's from 1867. It shows uh, uh, some figures in the foreground on yes. a roadway with houses in the background? Yes, yes. So as compared to the Monet work, you'll see that it still is much more distinct in the way the, uh, the images are created, but it's much different from the formal style that uh, preceded it. Uh, um, let me grab some notes here of mine. 
Was the previous painting we saw also a Pissarro, the garden at... Uh, it was, it was. That was from his late style uh, when he became what became known as a neo-impressionist and uh, painters like Signac were in that style and it's much closer uh, in terms of the uh, relative breadth of the brushstroke to the work that we see in Van Gogh. Uh, here in uh, Hermitage at Pointe Trois from 1867, pardon my French pronunciation, um, uh, his use of oil and pigment is closer to the official style, but his use of light and his coloring is part of the uh, distinction of impression, impressionism that uh, the distinct style of Impressionism with which we're familiar. Um, uh, okay, let me, let me talk about, uh, let me talk about uh, yeah, the, yeah, let me talk about uh, some of the uh, critical responses to the 1874 Impressionist exhibit, uh, about uh, 10 years after the last painting we saw by Pizarro. Um, this was the reaction of the, of the, uh, the established uh, Academy of Beaux Arts and the critics that uh, supported their, what we would call a point of view, but we felt like they were supporting uh, the very uh, integrity of the arts. They said about uh, Pizarro that the subject matter was vulgar and commonplace, like those peasants you saw in the roadway under natural light. The very uh, appearance of common folk in a painting was considered vulgar and and commonplace. As I mentioned to you about Delacroix, uh, uh, the style that was official uh, involved using classical figures and, uh, and elevating them in your artwork, which, which carried the art along with it, made the art as noble as the uh, historical figures or the mythological figures that they were representing in the work. Uh, you know, in Delacroix's work, you would have uh, allegorical figures, as I mentioned, representing the, representing liberty or France. The idea of just representing common people in common life, which was crucial to Pizarro, was considered vulgar by uh, his detractors. Uh, and the other word used was, was commonplace. Uh, Pizarro's paintings, for instance, show scenes of muddy, dirty, and unkempt settings. So he's not sterilizing the setting. He's not sterilizing the exterior. He's, he's desperately concerned to paint things as they are. I, uh, I think that can actually be taken ironically too, because everybody's pr perspective is subjective. We don't see things as we are. We, we, think, we see things as we've negotiated them to be. But as compared to the official style that Pizarro is working against, uh, it's, uh, it's certainly much more free uh, in Impressionism in terms of uh, at least representing life as most people leave it, uh, live it. Leave it? Live it. Uh, the manner of the painting of the Impressionist was too sketchy and looked incomplete especially consider, compared to the traditional styles of the period. The use of visible and expressive brushwork by the artist was considered an insult to the craft of traditional artists who often spent weeks on their work. Here the paintings were often done in one sitting and the, painting, the paints were applied wet on top of wet which means that uh, you're allowing the work to take very much place in the moment rather than uh, have something dry and essentially start all over again when you paint over your, your rough draft. 
in Impressionism, the, the, the image amasses in the moment. And as I, as I say, uh, oil painting takes days and days to thoroughly dry. And the Impressionists kept reworking their art uh, uh, throughout a single day where a, a shadow, a trace of the original effort is still in the painting. And, and this was a, a uh, very much a departure from the official style. Uh, the use of color by the Impressionists relied on new theories they developed, such as having shadows painted with the reflected light of surrounding and often unseen objects. So they didn't stage the light, much as you see uh, I'm having a poor job stage, staging the light for my, uh, for my pre presentation here. Uh, you know, they didn't show things in their best light in both, in both meanings of that term. They, they tried to show things as, uh, as people live in them, as people see them, rather than construct a scene that was supposed to be in some way uh, 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 uplifting to, uh, to the audience. Uh, they, they didn't want to glorify what they were looking at. They just wanted to open their eyes and see. Um, on the other hand, there were supporters of uh, the Impressionists when they had their first show, in, including the author Emile Zola, who uh, uh, had begun to work during the Romantic period, which in itself was a, a scandal in that it rejected some of the viewpoints of the classicists. Um, what Zola said was, rather than glorifying, consciously or not, the rugged existence of the peasants, he placed them without any pose in their habitual surroundings, thus becoming an objective chronicler of one of the many facets of contemporary life. You know, uh, much of the Impressionist mu movement took place in uh, Montmartre. And uh, Montmartre was a subject matter for uh, Pizarro. Do you see the picture on the screen now? Yes. Le Boulevard yes. de Montmartre, Matinee de Printemps, uh, meaning an afternoon in the spring. This was the street where, where, which was the center of activity in Montmartre, which is a neighborhood in Paris uh, up on a hilltop. It had been early on a, uh, the uh, a diocese of a, a church uh, that was uh, a big feature of the landscape and appears in a lot of paintings uh, from the period. So, you know, this is essentially uh, Pizarro looking out his window and recording what he sees. You'll notice the objects aren't distinct, but you certainly get an idea of a crowd. You certainly get an idea of a, of a crowded street. In these days, that looks like a very crowded street. I hope they're maintaining safe social distance. Um, uh, so he specifically says that this is this takes place in springtime. Um, we also have the same subject matter. Just a moment. <laughs> You should have uh, the Boulevard Montmartre at night. Yes. Yes, thank you. It's the exact same view, but, you know, hugely different from the last slide. Uh, it's not just that it's night. The way, the way light is rendered, uh, the street is well lit, the objects are well lit, uh, but the sky is dark. And check out that sky. Uh, skies don't appear blue at night. Uh, uh, you could say they're not truly black either, but the Impressionists dared to use uh, paint directly from the tube 
in many cases. They didn't, they didn't necessarily mix their paints. Uh, a mention was made in the, uh, in the critics uh, of Impressionism about their own theories of light. Uh, you have heard of the uh, post-Impressionist painter Georges Seurat and his famous work, uh, The Island of the Grand uh, Jat. Uh, uh, Poinchelism was based on an optical theory that was prevalent in the mid uh, and late 1800s, the time period that we're talking about, that uh, light is composed of uh, different components. Uh, and rather than mix them on the palette, they would put red next to blue or blue next to yellow. And the eye, the, uh, the eye of the viewer in the moment puts together the, the, the picture, puts together the colors themselves. Now, uh, Seurat, as opposed to uh, uh, Pizarro, created only seven full-size pictures in his whole lifetime because his Poinchelist technique was painstakingly slow uh, and much different from uh, the Impressionist style in that uh, it doesn't happen in the moment. It's a pre-calculated effect with many studies that went into each painting. Uh, and then he would organize his work almost in the same form as the classical artists had done and the romantic artists like Delacroix had done. He, he would arrange very specifically the, uh, the folks uh, standing around on that Sunday afternoon, which uh, was um, an abstraction of the Sunday afternoon crowd, not, not a particular crowd that exhibited at at a particular, uh, that uh, appeared at a particular time. And the contrast is to uh, the way uh, um, the Montmartre scene is represent, represented there by Pizarro. But the, um, uh, the one thing that they have in common is that for Seurat, the active process of looking and the way the eye blends colors together was essential to, uh, to, essential to his idea. Uh, and here is the same scene again by Pizarro, once again, Montmartre. And then this has the difference of being on a winter morning. So we've seen springtime, we've seen nighttime, and now we see winter morning, all of the same scene. So you can see, or you can tell, or you can understand that uh, the, the objects, while important, because he's trying to place us in, this, in the street, in this busy street, he's trying to give us the experience of a moment in a busy street. Also, the light itself is the subject, right? Uh, it started with the plein air movement, which uh, pre preceded uh, the Impressionists. Uh, uh, Pizarro was heavily influenced and taught by the artist Gustave Courbet, uh, who was an advocate of this style of painting. Uh, and as I say, Pizarro uh, attracted more liberties and assumed more freedom uh, to really make uh, light itself the subject of his work and his use of color, as I say, uh, and his indifference to showing uh, distinct solid objects and more of an, an overall look to the painting uh, that might be characteristic of a single glance out the window, uh, that as the subject of his work. That is what his work, uh, if you could say it's about anything, that is what his work is about. Um, so I wanted to mention from the point of view of uh, this idea of one movement of art in art history uh, following another uh, predictably uh, 
as often an antithesis of the point of view that precedes it. And then uh, later, after that point of view, uh, I'm speaking uh, in uh, Hegelian philosophy for you here. You have an order of the uh, classical view, the antith antithesis to the classical view, and then a, uh, a synthesis where two things are combined. And that's what we're going to see when we talk about the post-impressionists. They went back to the idea in a certain way of an allegorical style, style of painting. Uh, Gauguin's work con contains an impressionist handling of color, but an allegorical uh, way of dealing with subject matter. Uh, so my point is that movements in art, such as impressionism, are uh, uh, fluid, always changing, and it's one thing on th it's one thing after another, folks. Uh, and that there to to have the idea that there's some sort of dominance or some sort of official style, or uh, uh, as we um, uh, as we as art lovers need need to uh, keep keep in mind that the very style that someone chooses to express themselves is a personal choice. And I think now uh, that, that personal choice becomes the, the artist's subject, the way light was the, the artist's subject for the Impressionists. Uh, you know, um, uh, I'm talking about Impressionists. I don't want to leap ahead and talk about, uh, you know, uh, pop artists, for instance, like uh, Roy Lichtenstein or Robert Rosenberg or Andy Warhol, you've heard of these guys. Uh, one, one thing that makes them ag acceptable to the eye, although Warhol is no kind of painter whatsoever, is the ideas behind the work. So, so you see uh, how the change has come, how art has changed. Pop art is a movement that followed abstract expressionism and pure abstraction, which came on top of impressionism uh, with Dada thrown into the middle and surrealism thrown in after that, from a postmodern perspective, uh, the very idea even of a modern art is an artifact, a construct, uh, something that uh, at least intellectually we can reject. Though uh, the idea, the old standard, I don't know what art is, but I know what I like, is certainly an acceptable standard for, for the viewer. So people choose, you know, what appeals to them. Uh, when I'm talking about Impressionism, I'm, ta I'm talking about one of the most popular forms of art that has ever existed uh, in terms of the, uh, the, at least the financial value, and certainly the numbers of visitors who show up every year for traveling Impressionist shows that are organized and bring together arts from all around, uh, all around the world. Uh, uh, it's a treat to see these Impressionist shows. When I first started on my path as an artist, the very first show I saw when I was uh, 12 years old, some of you were, may have been there, uh, was the Van Gogh show that toured uh, uh, roughly uh, in the late 60s uh, here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And uh, uh, it was a packed show. There was a long line to get into it. I had that same experience when I saw a post-impressionist show at uh, the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Uh, I'm saying that there's an irony in the way tastes changed. A style that was vilified uh, when it first came out as being vulgar and commonplace is now exactly what many people think of when they, when they think of uh, uh, art, and uh, it's it's very much uh, this the standard today. Although when it it came out, it was the antithesis of the uh, of the popular style, the the thesis, if you will. Uh, so. I'm mentioning that uh, while uh, the Impressionist style celebrates the moment, what happens in the moment, I'm also trying to stress that um, art movements are of the moment too. 
that it's a mistake for us to say, well, everybody should paint like Pizarro. Uh, everybody should have the, uh, the skills of a Renaissance master. It, it turns out that what art is, is much, it's much deeper than that. What qualifies as art uh, to me is any effort by uh, uh, a human being to express their experience to others. Now, that might be as ridiculous as a banana taped to a wall. Maybe you saw that in the newspapers recently. Uh, someone made uh, thousands of dollars for something that was nothing more than a banana duct taped to a wall. It doesn't appeal to me, but the idea of artistic expression and the idea of, a, of an artist choosing that very peculiar image to represent his relationship to the ongoing interest that has never changed of the artist expressing himself, that idea is interesting to me whether I have any use for the image whatsoever. And frankly, I don't. But that, that freedom, much of that comes from, uh, comes from artists like Pizarro and uh, Monet, who were the, the first to toss aside conventionality, toss aside commerciality, for the sake of expressing their personal experience. For them, it was literally the experience of someone looking out the window. For me, it's the experience of these uh, nutsy ideas that I have in my head that I think are nevertheless interesting and that uh, someone else might appreciate them. Someone else might chuckle over them the way I do uh, in uh, my ironic way. Um, moment. I want to mention uh, the Romantic movement, which preceded Impressionism, because uh, the idea of this controversy that comes when one movement supplants another uh, is interesting, should be interesting to us as we consider Impressionism and Postmodernism. I, I want you to realize all moments uh, in art that lead to movements very much deal with the political climate, the social climate of their age. For, for instance, uh, the rise of Romanticism as, an, as a movement, and this was a movement that affected not only the arts, the visual arts, but also the theatrical arts and, and literature. Uh, Emile Zola, whom I just mentioned, was a Romantic writer, and uh, Anur Balzac, was a romantic playwright. In 1830, Balzac's romantic play, Hernani, ignited a firestorm as Paris broke into two overheated factions, supporters of classicism and supporters of romanticism. In the classical view, plays were performed for the benefit of the gods. In the romantic view, they were performed for the theater audience, the people who were actually in the room. If you follow me, uh, the, uh, if you think about uh, the, the work that's on the Sistine Chapel, you know, it's not, made, it's not made with anything less than a consciousness that God is looking, God is watching, God is, the, is essentially the subject of that picture. In the Romantic movement, that was, this, that was dispensed with, this classical viewpoint dating back to the, the dramatists of ancient Greece, that uh, uh, any sort of artistic uh, expression needed to be part of a long formal tradition where the utterances of the average man were excluded. The interests of the average man were, were vulgar. And that's why you know, uh, you have a play like Oedipus that deals with the mythological figures. Um, no other subject, subject matter would be appropriate. And Balzac, with his play Hernani, uh, dealt with er everyday life, bohemian life, in a romantic way, a, a, a tragedy, uh, uh, more... Uh, more to do 
with bohemian, a bohemian lifestyle into uh, uh, classical ideology and, and classical allegory. Um, the growing antagonism, wait a minute, the growing antagonism between a thriving urban commercial culture associated with the mass circulation newspaper, the popular theater, and the sensationalist novel, an increasingly moralistic and conformist official culture reflecting the tastes and interests of respectable middle-class audiences uh, was brought about by what was called in a derogatory way industrial literature, a code name for a whole range of popular phenomenon that threatened to undermine the stability and coherence of bourgeois establishment. Uh, what we're saying, what I'm saying is that in the 1830s, the generation that preceded Pissarro's work, uh, you, there was some reason why the formal tools of the artists were opening up and the, uh, the subject matter of a painting was changing. And it had to do with the first appearance of a mass popular culture. Uh, and think about this now, how many of us, uh, all of you are contemporaries of mine, how many of us cluck our heads over the fact that, uh, cluck our tongues, sorry, you can't cluck your head, cluck our tongues over how things have changed because of text messaging. I know I brood about this all the time. Uh, I was an English teacher for 10 years. Uh, text messaging is abhorrent to me. They use all those ridiculous abbreviations for words like please, and in my own humble opinion, uh, and it bugs the hell out of me. Can anyone write a complete sentence? Uh, the world is changing so fast. Uh, popular culture, though, has been changing uh, and, and was only established as early as the 1800s. The production of mass newspapers that any man on the street could have access to, whether they were educated or whether they were part of the bourgeois class or not, uh, the ordinary worker had access to that sort of uh, writing material. Uh, there was mass publication for the very first time of romantic fiction, which is a genre of fiction that predated what we know of as the novel. Uh, uh, it's interesting to me, the novel itself, uh, which uh, has the construct of being able to see into a character's mind, didn't exist as a as a as a style at all until Don Quixote uh, was published and Cervantes invented the novel uh, the the anti-heroic stance uh, in uh, uh, Don Quixote was specifically a parody of the romantic fictions that uh, continued to be popular after Cervantes wrote that all the way into the 1830s but this mass, this mass culture gave uh, a different point of view to the arts. I mean, there was no doubt that uh, Balzac was an artist. There was no doubt that uh, Emile Zola was, was an artistic writer. The question was whether or not they were going to be officially accepted or not. And so in uh, 1830, when uh, Hermani uh, went on stage, there was actually a, uh, an uproar in the audience with classicists booing every line and uh, the other half of the audience, um, students mostly, who consider themselves the new romantics, uh, cheering and, and uh, stomping their feet because you know they're finally seeing something that would is aligned with popular culture. Uh, to return to uh, uh, Impressionists, um, uh, I talked about mass publication and popular theater that hadn't existed before. One of the, imp one of the important motives for Impressionist artists was the existence of the camera, the photograph. The photograph was able to render accurately in a matter of seconds, anything uh, that you put in front of the lens. So that changed uh, the expectations of what painting was for. 
in a radical way. Uh, portraits that we take for granted, the snapshots that all of us have uh, seven or eight shoeboxes filled with of uh, ordinary moments in our ordinary lives, that, that wasn't possible before the invention of the photograph. And it was a hugely revolutionary thing, at least as revolutionary as the, the advent of the uh, internet in the 90s. Uh, and, and just as uh, crucial to changing the way uh, people think about reality, changing the way we deal with our everyday life and we perceive our everyday life. The photograph, a lot of artists said, made it irrelevant to have some technique that could render the object in three dimensions uh, and uh, rendered obsolete the necessity for uh, artists to master the skill of rendering light and dark in order to create a two-dimensional illusion of a three-dimensional object. Uh, the, the photograph could do that for you and instantly. So that was an impetus in the late 1800s for an artist like Van Gogh uh, to completely uh, look for another purpose for art rather than uh, pure uh, portraiture. The camera could do it so much, so much easier. So art became, became much more of a subjective process. And rotating around to a, a theme of today's lecture, and thank you kindly for your attention to it, uh, the, the moment for the first time and the, the subjective point of view for the first time becomes uh, prevalent in the arts. And now I would say, since Impressionism and Post-Impressionism are still the most popular segments of art history from the popular point of view, uh, those long lines outside of any exhibit of Van Gogh proving that, uh, that we take that for granted today. And it was hardly something that was taken for granted in 1830 or 1874 when the first uh, Impressionist show uh, got off the ground. Um, let's, uh, let's do one other artwork. There we go. You haven't seen anything yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, here we go. This is a uh, still life by Pizarro. Um, one interesting aspect of this, uh, you also see this famously in work by Cezanne, who uh, called Pizarro his master, uh, is that there's not even a single perspective in this drawing. Look at the way the light falls on the peaches, or I guess these are apples. He's not even good enough to discern, discern for me the difference between an apple and a peach. Uh, it's... It's irrelevant to the composition. It's irrelevant to what he's trying to do. Uh, the light isn't in the same position on the uh, peach on the bottom and the peach representing the, represented on the top. Uh, the light on the glass of wine is falling in a different, from a different angle than the light that cr produces the uh, shadow beneath the knife on yeah. the uh, left-hand side. Um, And then, you know, just the, the indistinctness, indistinctness, the indistinct objects, uh, that itself is uh, relevant to uh, a, a new way of looking at the purpose of painting, which is what Pizarro gave us. So uh, Pizarro seems to be the only uh, artists, artists that I've discussed today. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, Monet, and uh, Cezanne when I see you again. Um, but to uh, get back to Pizarro, an interesting, an interesting fact, this fascinates me, uh, he had to abandon his studio in, uh, uh, in Paris at the time of the Franco-Prussian War at the end of the 1800s, in the 1890s. And he lived throughout the Franco-Prussian War in London where he painted and where he complained that his art just hadn't caught on. And when he returned to his house in Paris, 
discovered that it had been used by soldiers, French soldiers, uh, to bivouac and to shelter themselves during the Franco-Prussian War. And uh, he had stored there thousands of paintings. And these paintings chronicle the, the origins of the movement that we know of as Impressionism. They chronicle Pizarro's uh, experiments in, in Impressionism. But of the thousands of paintings that he created and left behind in Paris, only 40 of them survived. The soldiers had literally used his work as doormats to wipe the mud off their shoes before they came into his house. Now, as you know or suspect, the work of Pizarro sells for millions of dollars and began to sell for huge sums of money as uh, late as the 1920s. So it wasn't very, it wasn't very long until oppressionism became the standard culture. But it's, it's hugely ironic, at least to me, that uh, these things that we deal with as masterpieces of art today uh, were literally treated as doormats by Pizarro's uh, contemporaries in Paris in the late 1890s. Um, and then the other, the other tragedy is, for the importance of art history, uh, think of what was lost, think of the culture that was lost when uh, well over uh, a thousand paintings were uh, destroyed by uh, casual misuse. So uh, there you go, that's, that's for today. Uh, if anyone wants to speak up and uh, make any comments, this would be a good moment uh, before I uh, uh, end the meeting officially in a couple of minutes. Uh, I'd uh, definitely appreciate your feedback. And uh, if we haven't gotten to uh, something that you're interested in di discussing or looking at uh, as we go through this course, uh, this would be a great time to give me that feedback because uh, what I'm going to present in the next three weeks is in written stone and I can certainly, uh, uh, unlike the Impressionists, conform to popular taste. I would just like to say thank you um, for doing this. It's bringing a little joy into our lives oh, at this day and, and so um, I, I for one appreciate it a lot. Um, so I'm glad we're all hanging in there. And yeah. I think too. I, I, this really, I didn't know how it was going to work out, but it's great. Oh, that's wonderful, Penny. Yeah, we really, it's, it's, I learned a lot. I took notes. It's great. Ah, <laughs> that's fantastic. It's fantastic. Might change the way we go to school. Well, <laughs> uh, it's going, it's going to need to, in my case, uh, one of my jobs is as a tutor to high school, uh, kids. Uh, who don't look like they're going to finish their uh, their high school term uh, ever getting back into a brick building. So, I mean, uh, this is my first class. I didn't want to admit that to you earlier. This is my first class on this platform, uh, and I'm happy you were able to get something out of it and that we didn't have uh, uh, too many uh, technical uh, uh, interruptions. Uh, well, we look uh, forward to next week. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, it was good for everybody to to get dressed up for this. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, I'm wearing a <laughs> suit of high, <laughs> but below my uh, <laughs> below the table level, I'm just wearing my boxer shorts. At least we're not in our pajamas, right? <laughs> we we dress, know. We uh, up and maybe, maybe we are. Here. Who knows? <laughs> what's really what's really amazing to me is going in in Paris, going from. Um, Montmartre to Paris Saint Germain, and the new in spot is the Marais uh, yeah. for art. It's, yes. it, and you can see that progression over the last decades. Yes, and, and, and definitely. My first visit a, in the early 60s. It, it, it certainly not only changed the subject matter, but I'm sure it, it represented a different, uh, a different philosophy as different groups of artists congregated and. Uh, uh, learned and were influenced by their contemporaries. And uh, what I would say about Pizarro is he's not generally considered uh, the 
the uh, founder of the Impressionist movement. That honor usually goes to Monet. But all of the Impressionists who followed him uh, considered him uh, their, their godfather, if you will. And he had a social influence on uh, uh, Van Gogh, who for uh, a time considered rooming with Pizarro uh, uh, when, when his own circumstances became so desperate as we know they were. Uh, and uh, Pizarro is a, a fantastic character. And I think all you guys are fantastic characters too. So thanks so much for coming to my Thank first you. meeting of this class. Thank all right then. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. Yes. And hello, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Okay. Howard, I think you're, you're in my music class. Howard, are you in Liz's music yeah. class? You look familiar. Yes. Are you in Liz? I am in Liz's. Oh, that, I yes. thought that's where I knew you from. <laughs> okay, okay, good bye, to everybody. see you. All right, everybody be safe. Be All well. Right. See yeah, you all soon. Bye.